uh, we have so much heavy reactions as people, uh, as Prabhupada writes, as Srila Prabhupada writes in the seventh canto quite regularly, that all the problems in the world stem from killing of cows, such as wars, pestilence, and various other calamities. This is the foundation for causing the whole society to suffer tremendously. And people can't see the connection, nor when we when we, they hear about it, they don't believe it. But this is what Krishna consciousness is about, to preach this message of Krishna consciousness and make people, uh, when we say, develop good qualities. So Srila Prabhupada started off in his society and still continues to create a Brahminical class of devotees, devotees who are qualified in Brahminical culture, which is the foundation for the operation of a pious and religious society. The Brahmins have to be there in order to advise the rest of society, particularly the manager class or the Kshatriya class. But unfortunately, the Kshatriya class within the Vaishnav culture has not fully developed yet, although to a certain degree it is, it is now developing. So until this, this society develops based on the Daivi Van Arshram, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishas, Sudras, also, but mostly the three up the three higher classes, then you have social chaos and you have very very difficult for people to follow religious principles because of the upside down nature of the society. Within the Vaishnav society, we are moving forward in the Brahminical culture, but we still need to develop that other area. So when you have Kshatriyas, they are guided by, by religious principles. And they are also martial spirit. In that way, Prabhupada said, that the managers in our temple should be ready to defend our temples at any time from outside aggression and should be trained in such a way. So this is not something new that we are just thinking about, it's something Sri Prabhupada has said many times in his classes, particularly his, his classes on the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, but particularly in the area where we are now discussing in the 16th and the 17th chapters of Bhagavatam of the first canto. So um, here you see a situation where um, a real Kshatriya will not acquiesce to a challenge because a real Kshatriya lives by the codes of uh, religious principles that govern the rule of a Kshatriya. And one of them is heroism in battle. So when Maharaj Pariksit approached this uh, personality who was dressed like a king, immediately, and he challenged him, this king exposed his so-called dress as being false. But he did surrender to, to Maharaj Pariksit, and because of that, he was relieved from ultimate punishment. But still, what is being explained here is that a real Kshatriya is one who takes charge of those who are under him and gives protection and care. A Kshatriya is meant to um, collect taxes from the citizens, but use 100% of that money back into the society in order to develop the needs of the progeny or the citizens. The Kshatriya class is not meant to take money for their own personal needs based on taxation. They are meant to earn their money separately from that and not from the taxation coming from the citizens. It's meant to be used for the development of the society. 
And so when we very carefully study the qualities of these different varnas and see, we have we understand that what Srila Prabhupada was saying was the society that is ideal for the practice of Krishna consciousness. And you'll read also in this section of the Srimad Bhagavatam that there are three features. Protection is the foundation for agriculture and for uh, for worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead because the ingredients given by the cow, such as milk, yogurt, ghee, and uh, cow dung and cow urine are used also for the direct worship of the Supreme Lord in the performance of service to the deity. And of course, the cow provides so many other benefits cultivates the field simply by walking on it. The bill of the bull becomes the tractor or the real tractor and develops the field for agriculture. Agriculture is the basis of the necessity of the human form of life. So all of this has been usurped by economic and commercial society in order to make it a profit and therefore we don't have any brahmanas, we don't have any kshatriyas in the world. A few vaishas here and there, most people are sudra or below. And therefore, when you give power to sudras, what do they do? They simply exploit for their own sense gratification. <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada's program for developing uh, Van Ashram was based on education of the different varnas accordingly. And then evaluation based on that education. And then, of course, taking that evaluation and applying it into practical service. In other words, evaluate someone, educate them according to that evaluation, and engage them in that particular service according to their nature and the development of the education. And so, therefore, Prabhupada's program was to establish Daivivan Ashram within our society as the prototype for a, a progressive society and then teach the rest of the world based on um, these principles of cow protection, um, worshiping of the Supreme Personality of God in, and of course the third principle is Brahminical culture, living according to the mode of goodness Modes of passion and ignorance simply are exploitive and destructive. The mode of goodness is the mode where the human being can find happiness and health, health and along with prosperity on the material level and execution of the qualities that are needed in order to worship the Supreme Personality of Dhatha. These are all characteristics of the mode of goodness. As Krishna mentions that, both in the Bhagavad Gita and in Srimad Bhagavatam. So this particular section that you're studying now, you yet you go on in these verses, you'll see what is the nature of this Kali Yuga and how it has degraded all of the finer sentiments of the living beings and has relegated the living beings simply to an economic entity that simply works to to supply the needs of a very few select people who are greedy for power and wealth. So we live in a very dysfunctional society, but Prabhupada knew that in time, if we develop this Vanashram Dharma according to these principles, as Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Bhagavatam, society will eventually progress to Krishna consciousness. So Van Ashram is not spiritual in essence, but it's the foundation by which spiritual life develops, therefore is required. And training people according to their different natures and engaging them in that activity itself. And protecting cows, agriculture, all of this is the foundation for a progressive and God conscious society. It sounds quite fantastic in relationship to what is present in our in, in today's world, but it, it is possible 
think the devotees become focused and start to understand in a very practical way how they can work towards developing this based on the, uh, the teachings of Srila Prabhupada uh, and those who are representing Srila Prabhupada today who are working in that, that direction. Uh, so um, the anomalies in today's society are simply due to the lack of God consciousness and the exploitation of the earth, the exploitation of uh, living entities such as Brahmins, cows, women, children, and old people are suffering tremendously. They have no protectors and they're being exploited by today's society in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can stop there. We can open up to questions. We have plenty of time for questions, so it's not limited. We can continue with questions for uh, at least a half hour or more. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj, for the class. Uh, so, dear devotees, uh, if you may have a question, a comment, you may indicate that by uh, using the hand emoji, and you'll be asked to unmute to ask your question. Again, thank you so much, Maharaj. Maharaj, I have one, one question. Uh, Hare Krishna Sri Devi. Hare Krishna. Good to see you. Hare Krishna. Um, Maharaj, my, my question is, uh, I mean, the text and the purpose, uh, the text talks about Maharaj Prakshit. And uh, in the purpose, Sri Prabhupada was talking about uh, the personality of Kali dressed in an artificial uh, garment like a king, even though he's not a king. And that's why Maharaj Prakshit had to deal with him. Now, wh what, what happens if the opposite happens? What I mean by that is if someone who by qualities uh, is qualified to be a king, but because of this maybe birthright or other external considerations, people do not consider such a person as a king. Uh, what do we do? Divana and ashram is, is created by Krishna and is found in almost every uh, society. So we may have uh, sannyasis in the different societies who may not dress like our sannyasis dress. When someone sees such a person with such qualities and still think that he is not a sannyasi and, and will not give him the due respect, what do we do? Hare Krishna. Well, that was like two questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's like two in a one. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah, um, well, in order, if, if there is a, a person who has qualities for leadership, but is not recognized for that, then the opportunity must be given for training. And that was Prabhupada's program for the Van Ashram College, that education and training should be there in order to bring out those qualities. Because uh, it says in this age, Kolo Sutra Sambhavam, that everyone is born sudra, but those qualities are there, as Krishna says, Chaturvanya Mayasrishtra Guna Karma Vibhaga Saha. That Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra are already there within the, it's called Swadharma, the nature of the living being's existence. So everyone has a particular Swadharma. But a lot of times it's just dormant because of Kali Yuga, there's no training and education. So in order to uh, take advantage of that and bring that out, Prabhupada's program was Varnashram College, where the Brahmins would be teaching the other Varnas the different skills according to the different Varnas. And then a person did have those kingly-like qualities 
if they went through that educational system, that would be that would be uh, recognized and then brought to the forefront, and then that person would have an opportunity to engage accordingly. So, yeah, without education, everything lies dormant. It's there, but it's dormant, just like our love for Krishna is situated in our hearts, but it's dormant. It will remain hidden unless it's brought out by the process of bhakti yoga under the guise of a qualified spiritual master. So these swadharma characteristics or material characteristics are also in a dormant stage and need to be brought out by education. Sometimes a person can recognize their own, own swadharma, but that is very rare. Or others can also evaluate a person's swadharma. But the educational system is more like a rounded system of understanding where qualified persons, such as persons who are in the position of Brahmins, who, who are qualified Brahmins. In other words, those who are in a position of spiritual leadership, would be the teachers and the evaluators also. So yeah, you'll find that. And you'll see, your question is very interesting. You'll see people today, in, especially in our society, who are engaged in certain activities, but not according to their nature. And therefore, so we find it's hard for them to stay steady. And therefore, people sometimes come in and out because they're not properly engaged. Of course, on the highest platform of spiritual practice, one can do any, any service. But we can't just simply put everyone on the highest platform and expect that that will work. And therefore, Prabhupada in 1974 outlined this whole process of education based on the Varnashram system. And the second part of your question, if a person is a sannyasi and uh, he's a bogus sannyasi or he's a real one? I can't remember what the question was. It's, it's, a, it's a real sannyasi, but due to external, uh, external perceptions, uh, people do not consider him as such. So what, what do we do? Well, the dress is not is not an indication of a person's qualities, his behavior is. So the each of the each of the ashrams have a particular outstanding behavior quality that kind of indicates their their uh, role. Now for a sannyasi, we might say there's two. One is strict control of the mind and senses. And the word strict is used. One who is strictly controls the mind and senses and one who preaches the message of Sanatana Dharma. And if they, and if they have been initiated into that, uh, that ashram, then, uh, then you might say, well, this is a sannyasi. Strict control of the mind and senses. And of course, that means following the regulative principles very carefully and preaching the message of Krishna consciousness. And a sannyasi's duty, at least for at least 10 years or more, is to travel and preach. So we indicate these things by characteristics. So if people judge without understanding the characteristics, then they won't, they'll judge wrongly. Well, thank you so much, Marit. Uh That is actually what happened because somebody uh, around the Gita Nagri community some time ago was making uh, such wrong judgment. And because the judgment was wrong, he, he was actually blasphemous. And uh, I, I I wanted to approach him and address address my feeling uh, to him, but 
I was advised to to just let go of it. But thank you for the answer, uh, Maharaj. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Shiman Bara Prabhu, please you may unmute. Dandavat Pranam Maharaj. Our glories to all the devotees on the platform. Um, and we are happy to have you on this forum. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question is uh, the fact that we prescribed um, a social system, say Varashan, we prescribe this and we prescribe, you know, what the what should be the ideal social and everything. But uh, the question may be asked, do we have, do we have uh, um, a, a model of what we're preaching? Or we are just, you know, like preaching utopia system, in a utopian state, whereas we don't really have anything to show for it, you know, like in the real sense of it. So that's my first question. Uh, we can go on pushing this, but if we, as long as we don't have anything to show, like a model, uh, it, be, it remains like a theory only. Yeah. So that's the well, first question. Yeah, well, there is, there is some efforts being done in different places around the world to develop that. Um, for instance, here in Mayapur, we are developing this Banashram uh, College here. We have a piece of land and um, we're gonna build a college on it. And then there are gonna be teachers in order to teach. And this is under the guise of Bhakti Raghava Swami Maharaj, who has been very diligent in trying to develop this Banashram system. So he's got a very great plan and there's many, much support coming from the local area and from the outside also. So that program is starting to develop. Um, other places is going on in a more uh, less direct way. In other words, in certain areas, farm communities are developing. Cow protection is is developing. You see that in Hungary. You see that in in uh, in Govardhan Echo Village. Many other places. So, uh, but and the only problem is it's not enough. <laughs> It's not enough. And the system has to be really fine-tuned in order to uh, educate people according to their particular nature. And therefore, that, that Vanashram College, which did exist in a couple of places around the world, but never really got off the ground, um, now is again being emphasized. So uh, we're seeing the, the the development of these these projects to some degree. Um, you can uh, you'd have to personally investigate closer to see how er actually everything is being done, but there is there. The only problem is there is not enough emphasis from the leadership in our society to develop in this way. May you might say because of there are so many projects going on in different ways and people are engaged in things, or some, some do not see the actual need for such emphasis, although they see the need, but don't want to emphasize it, make it the emphasis, or wanted to make it the emphasis. Therefore, he said, 50% of my mission is incomplete, develop these farm communities and develop an ashram. And then he gave the whole outline on how to do it also. And if you, you hear, if you want to hear the details, you, you go to uh, uh, a morning walk conversation in Vrindavan, March 14th, 1974, uh, with Vridayananda Maharaj asking questions of Prabhupada. Prabhupada really outlining the whole system. It's quite detailed. And he's made other lectures also similar to that. In 1977, on February 14th, a room conversation with Hari Sari and Satsuruk Maharaj. He also, Prabhupada, got very deep into it also. Um, but Prabhupada, actually, in the, in the real sense of the term, 
in September of 1977, Prabhupada left Vrindavan in a somewhat uh, ill state of health to go to Gita Nagari in, uh, in America to actually establish the show by personal example. He said, I'm going to teach you how to, how to develop this. Unfortunately, Prabhupada's health got worse and therefore he, he didn't make it to Gita Nagari. He got to London, had to return. So, but he has been showing us through his lectures, his books, and his final statements before he left that developed this, this system. And so it's gradually being done, but not fast enough. <laughs> and not enough emphasis is being put onto it. But it's happening. You know, our society is quite individualistic. So you find some, some yatras are focused in one way, other yatras are focused in another way. So... There are yatras who are focusing on this self-sufficiency. And especially today, with, with Western society falling apart, uh, the whole society is crumbling uh, economically. Uh, morally, of course, it's already finished. <laughs> um, so it becomes more of an emergency to move in this direction, to develop these systems and to engage devotees accordingly. So that's the focus. I just finished a book based on what I'm speaking about now, Ban Ashram and Farm Communities. The book is going to print right now and it should be released within two months, hopefully, about a month maybe, hopefully. And it outlines everything Prabhupada said in this about this particular topic. Uh, Maharaj, excuse me. Uh, Shri uh, second place. Maharaj, what, what, what is the title of the book, the upcoming book? It's called Krishna's Way Natural Living. It's, it's Krishna's Way Natural Living. Now, yeah, there's two titles. Krishna's Way is the book. Natural living is the is the subtitle. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Krishna is right. It's about it should be on Amazon, right? It's about a hundred pages. It's not very long, but it's a lot. Okay. It's just packed into that one topic. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Shumala, probably you may go with your second question. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, the other thing is that uh, sometimes. Um, in our presentation, we try to draw difference between Vedic culture and Vaishnavism. And uh, so it looks like we find, we find uh, solace or a way of escaping certain realities when we do not want to, to confront you know, certain facts about the presentation of Vedic culture, we say no. Ours, we are more Vaishnava. And sometimes, we are, when we are presenting a social system, then we also talking more about Vedic culture. So there's a kind of dichotomy about what are we actually offering to society? What are we actually offering to the society? And in one sense, sometimes we say it's, a, it's not Vedic culture, and in another sense, we say, oh no, this is Vaishnavism. That's one part of that question. And the second, the follow up of the same question is that. We also notice that for any system to, to function outside its origin, uh, like all the religious systems that are spread all over the world, uh, there's a level of adaptation with the local cultures or the local environment. And that adaptation helps that system to take root and to survive. Now, when we are not really certain about what we are really presenting, if it is just very culture we're presenting, or if it is just Vaishnavism we're presenting, then it becomes difficult to know how much adaptation is allowed, at what point we can really uh, fuse into what exists in order to be able to present you know, the beauty of Krishna consciousness. I hope you get me, Maharaj. Uh, this is yeah, what I'm trying to say. Yeah, the question is completely clear. And it's a very interesting question. Um, well, the Vaishnav culture, the foundation is the Vedic culture also. Vaishnav 
play is the foundation is based on Vedic culture. And then you can explore that simply by listening and reading Srila Prabhupada's books. He didn't, he adopted certain of the Western cultures and practical things for getting things done, but not as a way of livelihood, such as using uh, material things such as airplanes and cars in order to get around. And so he, he did that as an adaptation and said, we can use these in Krishna service. And so that was something presented by the Western societies, which made the preaching a little bit more, uh, what we say, quicker, faster, easier, more convenient. But of course, at the same time, he also showed that such adaptation also has its downside, such as pollution and all of the problems that come with some, uh, adapting them. But we can't expect that Western culture, where Krishna consciousness has supplanted, will look exactly like it did in, in the original culture in India, because it's just not practical. Um, it just doesn't, you have a completely different mentality of people, and you also have a different social environment. And so, therefore, this is the duty of the acharyas and the preachers to adjust by keeping the foundation of the practice of Krishna consciousness and without compromising um, the values that, that that culture has, such as the four regulative principles, um, the activities that go on in devotional service, and such as the temple activities and but, you know, just like for certain things, like Prabhupada said, you could wear Western dress for preaching. He said, you know, he uses the example of uh, Prahlad Maharaj when um, one statement where uh, Sandana Marka accusing uh, Vaishnavs to come, be, coming into the school and polluting uh, uh, Maharaj, they were they were in disguise as you know uh, they were Vaishnavs in disguise. So Prabhupada said, yes, we can also change our dress for uh, meeting the public, but we never should compromise our principles. And therefore, that is something that we've been struggling with from the very beginning and still struggling with too. How do we? Keep the essence of the of Vaishnav practice and the the, the 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 mode of good goodness qualities of the Vedic culture and combine them into a Krishna conscious presentation. So I use two examples: just transportation and clothing. It's, things were adjusted in order to facilitate the preaching. So for pre preaching, things can be adapted like that. But Prabhupada said, don't take advantage of that for your own personal sense gratification. <laughs> All right, Krishna, thank you so much. It's, and it's not an easy thing to actually do. Prabhupada was criticized for a lot of things he did by his god brothers and others. But he saw that this adaptation was needed in Western society. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to reach people with this message of Krishna consciousness. He said, I could have, if I had my way, I would have just, you know, preach Krishna consciousness. But people wouldn't have listened. So I built so many temples to invite people to understand Krishna and engage in the worship of the deity. He said, "If I, I, we could have just stayed underneath the tree and chanted Hare Krishna, distributed our literature and prasadam, but people would not be interested. So I made all of these temples. <laughs> so that was a that was a tactic in order to spread Krishna consciousness." <laughs> Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm laughing, Maharaj, because. I've heard, I've heard uh, some 
other authority uh, say something in line with what you just mentioned that for us as the witness, we don't care. Well, we can live under the tree and just distribute our books. But if we don't build a temple, where are we going to keep the books? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, we, also, it's also we, also, we also have the example of His, his, his Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj, who, you know, changed his dress. And when he was preaching in Africa, he was very much in, in the style of the African culture for presenting Krishna consciousness through that. So, you know, that adaptation can be done by those who are advanced in spiritual life and not just anybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Maharaj. Anyone with any question, comment, please? It's, it's, it's quite a rare to have Maharaj. So since we have him, let's take the advantage, please. <laughs> Thank you, uh, okay. thank you, Srimad Varahacharya, for doing that. were really nice questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj, for your response. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, so, Salika Prabhu, please, you may unmute. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my respect to the Byzantines. I bless this confidential power. I bless to you, Maharaj. Thank you very much for giving us your association, Maharaj. We are very grateful for your being here with us. Um, I'm just contemplating um, follow up actually on the Vara Prabhu's um, question and then the practicality of our philosophy and the teachings on the society. Um, how do we manage as devotees? Because sometimes it becomes so restless when you um, have to go, especially uh, when you preach in a larger society like the UN and other global organizations. Um, the ISCOM movement is known to have a depth of knowledge about uh, most of the challenges that the world faces. And when we go to that kind of a platform, we speak. And um, like, it's said, you get into so much explanation about how we could come to reality of this uh, financial system in our own setting. But how do we cope with the present reality that we are in? Because um, the fact is that we're still part of from the reality of these projects in many places. Uh, let me see. Uh... Sahadev, can you sum up the question and give me the, the essence? Well, uh, yeah, uh, his question uh, is, uh, how do we cope as devotees uh, in modern day society, especially when we try to present our teachings to a larger crowd, like maybe presenting Krishna consciousness to the UN body? Uh, how do we present our philosophy uh, in such a way that it will be acceptable by a body like yeah. the UN? And but, also, we do, not, we do not want to water down our philosophy, but also package it in such a way that it will be acceptable by groups like that and try to use it to the benefit of the world. First of all, we shouldn't we shouldn't consider ourselves like, you know, we're coming in here to teach you. We're presenting something that might be beneficial that you can adopt also in your own work in the world. So we present it in a very humble, but a very clear way. Um, we may also adopt the dress of the secular society in order to do that. That's, we don't change our eating habits. For that, of course, we respect, we keep that very clear. But there are devotees who have been doing that uh, in the secular society, meeting with um, people who are presidents of countries, people who are really highly placed in government. Um, and also, um, I think we also have um, Bhakti Kirtaswam's uh, um, 
and Sanyas disciple, um, um, Vasudev, I think he preaches on that level also to very people in that. So we can take examples from them. Um, you have to learn to speak their language and at the same time not compromise the philosophy. And so that takes that takes some intelligence, that takes some experience. Uh, that is called knowing your audience and presenting the knowledge according to how the audience can receive it. Though so we preach to different audiences and you have to know um, how to adjust not the philosophy, but the, the language in such a way that people will understand. You don't preach the same to, uh, you know, a yoga group as you do some politicians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both, both require a type of uh, understanding on how to do it. So there. Um, so, yeah, that is called uh, understanding time, place, and circumstance, and uh, acting accordingly. And so, um, that takes some experience and training, takes some knowledge in Prabhupada's books. And the devotees who somewhat are situated in the secular society, uh, have a working understanding of how the secular society works and how people can receive things. And so they're, they're in a good position to do things like that. So we're doing that in different areas, trying to reach people on their own level. But it requires, you know, that acumen, that ability. Not to compromise, but at the same time, present in a way that is understandable. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, I, I think that's always the challenge, how to fall in the middle, not to fall in either of the extremes. It's a, it's a, it's a struggle, but I think we shall get there. Uh, it takes practice. You have to learn yeah. a particular way by which you can deal with your audience. Yeah. Know, know your audience. That's yeah. the that's the key. Know your audience. Okay. Uh, Ari, Ari Chakra Prabhu, please you may unmute. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please assume my obeisances. This Hare Chakra from Gita Nagari? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> Very well, very well. Please assume obeisances. Good to see you, Maharaj. <laughs> I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward when I can come and get an ivory and dance with you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, my, my question is, uh, in the test, as uh, we said, Maharaj Parishit was, was uh, about to uh, punish Kali because Kali was pretending mm. to be a Chatriya, even yeah. though he's not. So yeah. he's, he, he's wearing the garb of a Chatriya, <laughs> pretending to be one. So he needed to be, to be punished for pretending to be like that. Uh, but in... Uh, Especially in our society, we realize there are some devotees who may be highly elevated, who have the qualities of a leader, but they've taken such a humble position that they will be working like, like sudras. In it. So to those devotees, like in the, or either the devotees or in a regular life, uh, are they also subject to uh, some sort of uh, reprimand because of being pretending? To be lower than what they actually are. <laughs> <laughs> I never got a question like that before. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it anyway. <laughs> uh, so let me think about that one. <laughs> well, I think what it, what the answer is is that those devotees 
they're always working under the guidance of others who are leaders. The leaders should see, oh, these devotees got, they have so much potential. I'll give you an example in my own life. I had a personal servant who he really wanted to serve me all the time. He wanted to do personal service. But I could see he had qualities to preach. And he was really good with interacting with people, but he he was more interested in just doing personal service for me. So I I actually pushed him out of that service and into the area of preaching. And because of that, he became a pretty amazing preacher and he changed the lives of many. So using that example, it's up to the spiritual master, it's up to the leaders to see the persons that they're working on her and push them in a direction where they can excel. They can do more service than they can. And so we don't punish these people for not doing it. We, it's up more, it's, it's more, the more responsibilities on the leadership to move these people accordingly. All right, you have this, you have these abilities, but you're not using them. You could be doing much better service, much more service. So that's up to the spiritual master, that's up to the temple presidents, up to the yatra leaders to see these the devotees and make these evaluations and put and try to inspire them to do more. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Because I, I observe this thing, especially like the youth, the youth who, who are in our movement now, a lot of the uh, uh, youth now. Some of them you could see that they have real potentials, but yeah. we don't engage them, and so they'll just be hanging around. And by the time we realize, they've fallen out. Well, they'll they'll they'll, they'll go out and get a job and be successful in the material world. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the sad part. Yeah, it's up to the leaders to to look for that and push people in that direction. Education, encouragement. You're right, we have a lot of youth who are highly qualified. Who are not being, they're not giving the chance to actually, uh, you know, engage properly. Hare Krishna, thank you, Maharaj. Anyone else? Are there any question? Comment? Uh, Maharaj, I have, I have one, uh, I would say it's a silly question. And uh, that is, uh, I, I don't know Sanskrit, but when we chant the Sri Guru Bandanam, Sri Guru Charanapatma, the translation, it says that the spiritual master is my Lord, death after birth. So the spiritual master is the Lord uh, to the disciple, birth after birth. Now, if we have such a spiritual master, and the spiritual master also is at liberty to accept or not accept disciples. Now, if the spiritual master does not accept a disciple who is birth after birth, supposed to be the disciple or the servant of that spiritual master, then what happens to that devotee? Uh, if the spiritual master has a disciple and uh, he doesn't no, 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 the spiritual master does not want to accept disciples. I, like in this lifetime, a spiritual master uh, can have disciples, but he decides not to take yeah, well, one of disciples. You'll see in our movement, there are spiritual masters who have thousands of disciples. Yeah. And then you see spiritual masters who have maybe just a few. Yeah, there's many in between. Yeah. So um, they usually the spiritual master has to decide how many disciples he can take on, 
And the other thing is that he may also decide who he feels qualified to become a disciple. So that's part of the uh, evaluation system that's called aspiring. During the aspiring time, spiritual master observe the person to see if this person is qualified to come up to the standard of becoming a disciple. Um, so that 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 uh, decision is there with, with the spiritual master. But I think the problem is that we have we don't have enough spiritual masters. Mm. And that's that's also been mentioned many times. Uh, because Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has and which is quoted in Srila Prabhupada's fourth canto purports, and he said, one should not take on too many disciples because it becomes a burden for the spiritual master. So therefore, in order to avoid that, you know, problem of having too many disciples, you can't take care of them or, you know, can't uh, take the weight of their spiritual, the, the karma that they give, then there should be many more and more spiritual masters. So yeah, that's our society. We're looking always to see who's qualified to come up to that standard and then give some training and give some direction. So um, anybody out there want to be a spiritual master? <laughs> <laughs> we need more that's the, that's, the, that's the duty of uh, the society is to provide more and more because the world I mean we're a worldwide movement There's, we need more and more people to take on this responsibility but they have to be qualified otherwise if they take the position just like if, just like this uh, Kali who took the position of a king and he wasn't qualified. But therefore, one has to be qualified to take on that position and one will be tested prior to it and during. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For me, Sahadev, I only have one wife <laughs> with a king, uh, four boys and I'm suffocating. So I, I'm okay with where I am at. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Somebody well, else venture. We, we also have devotees like yourself and others who know the philosophy and who are fixed in their practice. They can be inspirations for others, although they might not be in the formal position of a spiritual master. They can still inspire devotees by preaching Krishna consciousness. So everyone, anyone and everyone can preach. Yeah. But not everyone and anyone can become a spiritual master. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, do you still have a few minutes for us? Uh, yeah. I'm okay. About, I'm about 20 minutes to nine in the evening here. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. So, uh, Salika Prabhu, you may unmute. Hare Krishna. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much, Maharaj, for your compassion. Um, uh, the last question and the answer just uh, brought me back to the test of today. Madak Parikshit's presence made personality of Kali to, to unveil his original self. And when we look at the spiritual master, the spiritual master is supposed to be like a mirror to reveal the uh, weakness in the disciples and make them actually surrender. When we look at Shila Prabhupada's life, before Shila Prabhupada, um, started ISKCON movement in India, he wasn't able to get so many people to follow. But when Shri Prabhupada started the movement and this movement became successful in the US and he went back to India, both in the US and in India and everywhere all over the world, Shri Prabhupada was presence was able to make the most sinful person surrender themselves. So our present generation now, um, devotees as we get into the third, fourth generation of devotees we see that the 
personality that are arising does not have that kind of shakti. Like Shila Prabhupada, like the direct disciples of Shila Prabhupada, their presence does not in such a way um, affect the, um, the devotee, um, people to join the movement like it is in the past. Yeah, you have a good point, but the point is that those who are here have to represent Srila Prabhupada. They have to be transparent to be speak exactly how Srila Prabhupada spoke according to their own level of realization and preach. So Prabhupada is preaching through his disciples and through others also, even if they're not disciples. Prabhupada is still personally present in his desire to spread the movement. And so he is empowering his disciples who want to preach on his behalf to be his representatives. Of course, no one can replace Srila Prabhupada. He was a Shaktivesha avatar. He, was, he came with a mission to spread Krishna consciousness. He was directly instructed by Krishna to do this work. And he's, um, you know, a very confidential associate of Krishna in the spiritual world. So, you know, we can't come up to that level, but still we should represent Srila Prabhupada in everything we do. And that will have a great effect. The idea is to be sincere without personal motivation. If any of his representatives have personal motivation, they block Srila Prabhupada's shakti. They block his ability to spread Krishna consciousness. So it's up to the disciples who are representing Prabhupada, all of them, everyone, even yourself, everyone, to be free from personal motivation. That we want to assist Lord Chaitanya and the Acharyas in bringing Krishna consciousness around the world. And we're willing to make a sacrifice in order to do that. We're not looking for personal gain. We're looking for to, to please Krishna. We know by pleasing Krishna, we will also benefit by pleasing Krishna. So this pleases Krishna the most. So Prabhupada said, remain sincere. He said that over and over again. You know, remain sincere. That means we have to be transparent. We have to be somewhat free from our own desire, personal desires, but simply reflect the desires of the Acharyas, the desires of Krishna. That's it. And then there's a great power in that because Srila Prabhupada will use that to spread Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense, man. It just does make okay. sense. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj. Maharaj, we, we're praying and we're pleading with you that by Guru Krishna's grace, uh, you, 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 you travel with some of us to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> to see the devotees live in person <laughs> someday. I don't know when, but someday <laughs> I'm praying. All right, right I'll, I'll, I'll put it on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, Hare Krishna, thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for being such a wonderful, sweet uncle to us. Uh, we, we cannot really think of paying you back your love and your care concern for us. Thank you so much. Thank Are you, Saradev. So nice to be with you. And all the, you. all the devotees there in the African Yatra there. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So uh, if no one has any more questions, uh, we have our routine ritual we do. That is, we're going to humbly request all the devotees to kindly unmute. And then we chanted the loudest Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to express our appreciation for Maharaj's presence here today. So please unmute yourselves. Jai. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna
Thank you, Krishna. Jai. Thank you.